Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. Now, is it possible to put your life together after it's been completely shattered? I don't know if it is, but today we're going to be talking with Margaret Thompson in regards to her new book, The World Looks Different Now, a memoir of suicide, faith, and family. Now, Margaret is a journalist and TV producer who's reported on a variety of subjects from the Middle East politics to the British royal family. As a radio correspondent for ABC News, she was the first American broadcast journalist to report the end of the Falkland Wars in May 1982. Several years later, she became the first radio correspondent to report on the AIDS epidemic in Africa. Upon returning to the United States in 1992, she taught journalism and television production at the University of Memphis. In 1993, she worked as a production associate on the HBO documentary The Trial of James Earl Ray. Today, Margaret continues to write for print and online publications. So let's welcome to the show, Margaret Thompson. Thank you, Marianne. I'm so glad to be here. Just so honored that you would have me on. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm the one who's honored. I have to tell you, once I picked up your book, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I was crying. There are parts of it that are just heartbreaking, but it's so important right now, I think, that people read your book. Well, thank you. You are so kind. And and one of my concerns has been or was as I was writing it is that I didn't want to upset people. I didn't want to, some people use the word trigger. I didn't want to trigger people who maybe had had traumatic experiences and that sort of thing. But thank you so much for that response. And again, I hope it wasn't uh, too upsetting. It, It is a little bit intense in places. I realize that. Thank you for that. Well, I think it needs to be because we really have an authentic discussion here about, you know, suicide and faith and family. There's so much that goes that's involved in this. And so I have to ask you, you know, why did you decide now was the right time to write this book? Well, it had been evolving. My book had been evolving for quite some time. Um, My son died in 2010 I was working on another memoir at that time, a different memoir, I kind of fixated with memoir, kind of a student of memoir. I love memoir. So I think it's quite a challenge to write a good memoir, readable memoir. I was writing about my earlier life in London as a journalist. But when my son died on August 28, 2010, of course, I set that aside. I couldn't write anything for weeks or months or I just set that aside and said, that's that's never going to happen. That's that's not going to be finished. And then gradually, after a few months, and I also had a writing coach who was a friend, and she would even come over to my house, kind of like almost literally holding my hand. I just started writing and tried not to put myself under pressure. I had never been a good journaler before. I, I admire people who are. But of course, I just started taking notes in notebooks and the computer, sometimes longhand, sometimes not. I think that would have been a really good exercise no matter what came out of it because it's it's almost like a scrapbook. There's no way I could remember those events now, 10 years, almost 10 years on. So at the end of sort of the first year, I kind of had a rough draft, but it was it was really dr- rough. And I think having been a journalist, I needed a goal. I, I couldn't really imagine it being published or even if that would be a good thing or a bad thing, but I needed a goal of feeling like maybe it would get out there in the world in one form or another, because I knew I had written long form journalism, like two to 4,000 word magazine pieces. I had done television scripts and radio scripts, but I kind of had this ideal held up in my mind of writing something much longer, like a standard book length is 80,000 words. So it it continued to take quite a long time. I I think if it had not been so personal, and of course I could not attain objectivity. I wanted objectivity like a reporter, but that I knew was kind of just a total farce. I could not be objective about what had happened in my own life, but I longed for that objectivity. So I longed to step back 
And really, I think that's the hardest thing when it comes to writing anything, especially the longer it is, the more difficult this aspect is. And that is to know what to put in and what to leave out, what to cut, what to include, what to exclude. So that kept me, I wrestled with that for quite a few years. And then in 2016 or so, around that time, I set everything aside again put the book aside like I had done with the first one. And my husband and I moved to Middle Tennessee from Memphis. We moved to the Nashville area where our daughter-in-law and our granddaughter, who was our deceased son's only child and was two years old at the time of his death, they, they've been living here ever since his death. And we wanted to have a, a much closer relationship with them. So as anybody knows who's a writer out there who's tried to write, it creates total havoc when you move. (laughs) So um, a lot of writers say, I won't move. I don't care. I'm not upsizing, downsizing. I'm staying where I am because it creates such havoc. So I thought, well, I probably won't finish this. Maybe I don't even want to. So I didn't do anything for another two or three years. Then I picked it back up. I think it was in 2018, wrote a another draft, another revision, but it wasn't too far off what I had written before and um, went on from there. So it's kind of, it's kind of a frightening journey, I think, to people if they want to write something, maybe they could probably do it in a year, what the same thing that took me 10 years to do. But you, you kind of are like that about grief too, I think, that you just can't imagine when you're embarking on this grief journey how long it's going to take, especially if you're a parent or maybe mothers or feel a little bit differently. You just, you can't say to yourself, this is going to take 10 years. Oh, well, no, it's really going to take longer than 10 years. It's it's going to stay with you and it's going to be with you forever. Well, I think as we're going through this time, this unique time in history, you know, it's interesting that you really picked up writing your book in 2018. And I know there was a recent report from um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in regards to suicide rates and saying that since then, there's been a 35% increase in rates since 2018. So you look at this and it's like, you know, I think your book, while it was personally driven, will help so many people who are really going through such a difficult time. And, and really addressing some of the tough questions as, you know, we deal with the ones that we love that have passed, or maybe someone's going through a difficult time and they're considering suicide. Mm-hmm. I think if I'd set out to write it saying this is going to help someone, I would have been just so intimidated by that idea. Maybe not if I were a professional therapist or uh, in a role like that, but I just had to do it for me. But of course, I I would be very gratified if it were helpful to someone in any way. It, it I know it can be painful. I, I know of a couple here where I live who recently lost their son and the husband embraced the book. He read it in one night. His wife, when she saw a copy of it, at our house, she looked like she was looking at a snake. She was utterly terrified. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to push it on someone. I think when they get into it and they start reading, they find, okay, I can, I can handle this. But the two issues I had and then did struggle with was, am I, why am I writing? Am I writing this to help someone? Am I really that altruistic? A person, I would say probably not, (laughs) because I can't imagine what will help someone else may be very different from what would help me. So I didn't want to project. I didn't even think about it. I was just in the story and I was writing it in episodes, in scenes, relaying what happened and not thinking, probably fortunately, is this going to help someone? And then on the other hand, I was also not thinking, is this going to trigger someone? Some some people label their work. This this work, this piece or this blog post has may have triggering material in it. Maybe that maybe that's a good idea. I, I'm not really sure. I just wrote 
I just wanted to immerse myself. And also I would say overall, I was searching for meaning, which I, I don't believe can ever be a bad thing to do, but it was a difficult search or quest or journey. Memoir is often referred to as a journey. I knew that with the subject being suicide and the event being having been suicide, the suicide of my older son, that the search for meaning was going to be very frustrating. Some people would say suicide is a very nihilistic attitude of uh, action, that there is no meaning. It's the people will say it's senseless. It's meaningless. So that search was made difficult for that. But I will say to quote a great, great writer and mentor of mine, a great uh, student of memoir, Tristine Rayner, who wrote the, the, the Bible, the guidebook to writing memoir. It's called Your Life as Story. She says in there that the only meaning one can find from certain events may just be aesthetic. So it's the ability using memoir to cultivate the ability to make something beautiful, beautifully crafted, she says, out of what in life was arbitrary, ugly, or painful. Mm, Isn't that the truth? And I love how you weave that together with the faith part in your book, because, I mean, there is a lot of faith in your book as you're, as you're moving forward through this difficult time. And I don't think anyone ever, you know, and um, move completely moves through it. I think when you lose a child, like you were saying earlier, that's with you your entire life. Yes. I think that could be one of the elements that's just so terrifying, especially to parents. I knew someone whose daughter uh, took her life about six months before my own son. And I wrote about that in the book that I uh, deleted her number from my phone. That that was six months before my own son died. And I think I say in the book, then, wow, did people delete my number? Are they deleting my number? Or how can I be, how can I be more compassionate now than I was then? But I, I do believe that parents and others are terrified there's the suicide contagion that that may be real. The uh, the experience that others may do the same thing. That even if you and I are talking about it, like we're talking about it now, that it could prompt someone to do that. I mean, I hope not, because like you, I feel there should be a frank and open discussion of suicide. And maybe somewhere I was reading a hundred years ago it was like this with cancer. People didn't talk about it. They were afraid of it. They thought there was maybe a contagion factor to that. And now of course that's, it's discussed much, much more openly and maybe that will happen. Maybe that will come out of the pandemic, but I hope that it doesn't come out of rising suicide rates, but I think we know that they are rising and they're, they're, I think I've read the most striking factor causing the rise has to do with um, economic factors can provoke people to move in that direction. But um, I think it's an important issue that needs to be addressed. 48,000 Americans died by suicide in 2018 or more. If you, if you divide that up more than 130 people a day or one every 11 or 12 minutes. Wow. I mean, and those just are just seemed, staggering. Yes, the numbers are the numbers are staggering, and they've been going up. They've been going up steadily. They've been going up in certain age groups, like the fifteen to twenty fours, maybe more. It, they're going up amongst the military. My son was a soldier in the army, but I didn't want my book to be just this is for people in the military or this is what the military is doing, or this is what they're grappling with. Again, I go back to my mentor, Tristine Rayner saying it's what you're doing is if I could be so bold and I don't consider my work art, but it is a piece of art. It stands alone and it's for people to get out of it, what they need to get out of it, whether they're, if they're a parent, they need, they get something if they're if they're a military spouse, 
Maybe they get something else. Mine is not about the loss of a spouse, but maybe they can get something. So I try not to impose any, any too much of a framework other than a narrative. I am telling a story because I felt that was the only way I could hold people. That if I went into a lot of statistics, like I just recited a few to you, maybe I would I would lose people. And then you mentioned very important the faith piece. I didn't want the book to be categorized as a religion book or religion memoir or on the religion shelf or in a religion bookstore. And not that I that would be wonderful and I would be so gratified by that. It was just a piece of our life. It was a thread of those of those three elements, the suicide, the faith, and family was definitely a major element. And we just relied, we relied on our faith, but I wouldn't want to deter a person who was not of the Christian faith or not of maybe not of any faith or some other uh, belief system. I wouldn't want them to not want to read it or to not get anything out of it. So it it's there, but hopefully it's not overbearing or judgmental in any way. No, I found it was a very nice blending of your story and how you bring this all together so we can have this discussion. You know, I um, suicide's never the, the answer to problems. And I just want to share real quick the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. That number is 1-800-273-8255. There's always someone there if you feel like you need um, someone to talk to. But, you know, I have to ask you, as you were writing this book, did you feel that was cathartic for you in many ways? Or how was that? I think it was. And I think that catharsis is still coming. I, I think it will really come when now that the book is out. And it is still an ongoing, gradual process. I do think if you expect writing something to be that ultimate catharsis or heal you, you you might be putting too much pressure on writing or on the act of writing or have expectations maybe that, that are too high. I think some of it was healing, but some of it was very difficult where to the point where I would think, do I really need to be doing this? So of course you have to take breaks and maybe that's why it took so long. You have to recharge yourself with renew yourself with other activities. So do you feel that there is a point where your background as a journalist and TV producer kind of took over in your writing? Oh, yes. I think it was kind of maybe kind of crazy. You know, you don't you're I was a mother, a grieving mother, but I was trying to establish control. We all want to have an element of control and a uh, suicide in your family, the suicide of your child. That's probably the most out of control event that you could ever imagine happening. It's like that moment in keeping with the theme of your show. It's that moment when you receive that news that is the pivot around which your the rest of your life will turn forever. Do you feel that the Army has some blame in regards to your son's death? I definitely did at the time because I just, I just wanted to be angry. I I wanted to be angry with people. Uh, I wanted to find a focus for my anger. And of course I knew that I was angry with my son. I, I said that to the chaplain, the military chaplain. I said, I'm just so angry. I'm angry with him, but I said, I'm angry with God. And the army did not do everything correctly. No one does. No one's perfect, whether they're in the army or whether they're not in how they handle things. And I believe when there's been a sudden death and a, and, or a tragedy like suicide, people aren't going to get things right. 
I didn't get things right. You're not, they're not going to be at their best. They're not going to be acting at their best, behaving at their best, doing the right things. And without giving too much away about the book, I will say that I was not notified in the correct manner. So that kind of threw everything really off kilter. That probably started that anger toward the army right away even though I really didn't know too much about the military and how the military operates. And I'd only been on a base twice. I had been to Fort uh, Knox to see my son graduate from basic training. My husband and I went and our daughter-in-law, and then I had been to up to Fort Bragg once before the incident happened. And we were in Memphis and we flew up there. My husband and I just immediately got any flight we could get, like a flight to Raleigh wasn't even where we needed to be, but to get to get up there. Because again, I think you want to you want to do something. You're just crawling out of your skin. And that's that type of description is the sort of thing that again may make people feel uncomfortable in the description of that moment when you when you receive the news is that 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 again like the theme of your show it's that life changing life altering moment and you want to just rewind the tape if you're in television or radio you want to just rewind the tape and go back to where was I or where was I in those moments before I knew I was this innocent who had no idea what was I doing in those hours, which I describe in those hours before I received that, that shattering life, shattering life changing news. And again, going back to the journalist thing, I think, especially when I was really young starting out and I was working overseas in London at quite, quite a young age. And when you're very young, like say early twenties, mid twenties, you, you don't think anything's going to happen to you anyway. Whether you go to a war zone or you do this, you you get in dangerous situations like covering an IRA bombing or something like that. Those were fairly familiar occurrences for me. But to, I think as a journalist, you always feel it's not going to happen to me. I'm observing what's going on. I am not going to be a casualty. I'm not going to be injured or killed So I just think you had asked me before, and I don't think I gave you a good answer, but I had, I wrapped myself in that cloak after hearing the news, shortly after hearing the news, I would say by the next day, by the next morning, when we had arrived at Fort Bragg and we were like, felt like we were on the face of the moon. We didn't know where we were on a mammoth base like that. Then I went into reporter mode had my phone, had notebooks, had, it, it kind of just gives you something to do. And my husband, I said, please make these calls. I said that in the book. And he says, no, I would, but you wouldn't be happy with what I'm going to say or how I'm going to frame the questions. So you really, you have to do it because you're just going to be so upset with me. So I started calling the, uh, whatever they call the MPs, the military police office, just like I would call a police station if I were working as a newspaper reporter in Memphis, Tennessee for the shootings that night. I call the, I call the MPs and ask them, what do you know anything about this incident? And so on and so forth. But of course it felt completely crazy making. I should not have been doing that. And I say that in the book. I say, I should be lying in bed at home with people bringing me casseroles and putting cold compresses on my head or something. I should not be here. It's you're just you're in such a state of shock that literally I've heard that it is you should not make major decisions, as they tell you, for months, if not years. You you need ministering to during that time. But I did put I did put on that that journalist mode that gave me the false feeling of control and it also gave me something to do. Well, I, I can definitely understand that because I mean I think you know just from a soul level, you know, you want to do something so bad, 
you know, and at the same time, it's like, what, what could you do? And so falling back on your background and your experience, I think a lot of people would probably try to do that in whatever capacity works for them as well. Well, maybe it was an understandable response. Again, I was thinking, how am I doing this? How am I standing upright? How am I moving through time and space and going here and going there on this mammoth base trying to figure out what's going on? And again, at that point in the book, the portrayal of the army is probably not good. I wouldn't say it's a, it's certainly not a revenge portrayal. I I wasn't out to just vent, vent, vent about how badly the army sort of botched certain aspects of it, of the notification and of the handling of the whole situation, because we were in Fort Bragg for about a week. Luckily, it didn't take longer than that to get everything settled. But um, it it really wasn't intended at all to be a, a venting exercise against the army. But it felt at the time that we were suffering, we were experiencing avoidance. It, that's what I believe the suicide loss survivor feels is people are avoiding me. And maybe they are, maybe they're not. There's a lot going on on a huge base with 50,000 soldiers on that base. I'm not sure how many, but a large base. Obviously, we were probably not their top priority, but it could feel and it did feel like avoidance and and then you go back to well, what people don't know what to say and you know they don't know what to say and you don't know what to say either. Your reactions might not be appropriate. I give a pass to anybody who is a suicide loss survivor. For example, I know a gentleman who also lost his son. He went out and played golf the day he received that news. And he's the most sensitive, most caring, most kind man But that was what worked for him. That is how he expressed or expresses himself. So I think people get a pass unless unless they're doing something that really seems like it's it's going to injure them and harm them in some way. But uh, later on in the book, the army becomes more of the hero of the book, which to me is fascinating. I never sat down and planned that. Oh, well, the army's going to come out looking good in the end. I think it was the result of what happens when you just write and write and write and you let it evolve. You kind of have an idea of where it's going. I think that's helpful to have an outline, to have a narrative arc, where is it going to go and how is it going to end kind of thing. But I didn't expect those conclusions to come out that the army really ended up being compassionate, some compassionate people who did a lot for me. They they did a lot for me by allowing me opportunities to actually speak to, to soldiers and to do other activities. Again, I don't want to give away too, too much as far as what happens. I want it to be a, a compelling narrative read that holds people, but I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to them. They're, they're wonderful people inside the armed forces. And of course, outside the armed forces, it's just maybe in that moment of tragedy. And again, that pivotal life changing moment that people are not really at their best. I I wanted to climb out, like I said, climb out of my skin. I wanted to climb out of my life. I wanted to just not be me anymore. I did not want to be uh, the woman, the mother whose child had taken his life. This is not me. This is not who I am. I want another identity. I was used to the identity a long, long time ago of journalist, of, of broadcaster, of Um, I gave a lot of that up for both my sons when they were born. It, for me, it did not work very well as a compatible career with that. So then you adopt the role of mother. Then how do you ever get to the place or adopt the role of bereaved mother again, or bereaved parent or not excluding the fathers, bereaved spouse 
how do you say this is me? And I think that's what people wrestle with. And that's what takes so many years to kind of let that evolve into acceptance. So for people who are going through grief right now, what is one thing you would like them to take away from your book? I would like for them to take away that there is hope. There will be hope. That suicide, again, I think people shun it, steer away from it, avoid it, because it seems like the erasure of hope. But there is hope. And life does go on. It will go on. Even when I had a friend who had a son who died 10 years uh, before mine of suicide. And I was, how is she still living? How is she still going through this? So she was, she was kind of like hope personified for me and that there will also, there will be closure. That same friend who had lost her son 10 years prior to mine. And I just did not believe her when she said, time is your friend. It, It sounded like such a cliche and, but it's not, I think time is your friend but you have to use it. You have to do something with it. I think you have to kind of grab it and be a little bit proactive and not just say, okay, time's going to wash over me and it's going to heal everything. But time will give you that, that partial closure, I believe. And you may not even want full or complete closure. I think a lot of mothers, myself included, and I've been writing about this, what, what is closure? And I I wrote at one point, I said, it's blasphemy to a mother, you don't want, you don't want yourself or the world, and you will never forget your child, but you don't, it's just a horror to think my child is not remembered. Like I have the 10th anniversary of my son's death coming up. But I probably won't. (laughs) I may not even post anything about it on Facebook because people will probably, or you're still worrying what people think. Oh, here she goes again, you know, another anniversary, but you, you will, I believe the, the suicide loss survivors, even when that loss is their child, they will eventually have the, the degree of closure that they need and want. Well, I think any way you choose to remember your son is going to be honored by so many people who are either going through grief of their own or know the the loss of a child and going through that grief as well. I think it will help a lot of people, you know, just open the discussion and start having the conversation about their grief because being stuck in grief is a really horrible place. Yes, it is. And that may be a situation where a person does need professional assistance of some kind to get out of that stuck place. It it certainly is a, is, is something to be avoided and to know, or have hopefully have people around you who can sense that maybe you need some kind of assistance to move out or move through it. I think at times maybe I was stuck, but I kept writing and I kept going which seemed to work for me. Again, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. I went to groups too. I went to Compassionate Friends, which is a nationwide group for parents who've lost children. I went to a suicide support group run by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP. So those groups were there. They are there. I think they can help. Even when you think they're not going to help, they can help. Well, Margaret, where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book and your work and be part of your community? Well, I would be thrilled if they would like to be in touch with me through my website, which is Margaret Riley Thompson, last name spelled T-H-O-M-S-O-N dot com, no P in Thompson. And my middle name is in there because I do have a lot of journalism or have had in the past that was under my maiden name, Riley. And that same name is also my handle, I guess you call it, for LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. I also have a Facebook page that's called Journalist Margaret Riley Thompson. And my Twitter handle is M Riley Thompson. 
Well, Margaret, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much, Marianne. I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, thank you, Margaret. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The World Looks Different Now, a memoir of suicide, faith, and family. The World Looks Different Now is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. And of course, it's available on Kindle. Again, if you'd like to reach out to Margaret, you can at margaretreillythompson.com for more information. Also, if you need help, know that you're not alone. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, both in English and Spanish. And that number is 1-800-273-8255. Again, that number is 1-800-273-8255. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.